Creating Language Learning Games for the Classroom by David Neville, Digital Liberal Arts Specialist at Grinnell College. Presented on 9 December 2016 at the Immersive Environments Colloquium at Vanderbilt University. In this presentation, I would like to detail the development of two language learning games, a text-based interactive fiction game and a 3D digital game-based language learning environment, before ending with a description of a project I am currently working on, a 3D VR simulation of a 19th century sugar plantation. But first, a short story. I was in my drop pod, suspended halfway between the sun-scorched sands of a future desert battlefield and my airborne Titan warship when the idea came to me. I had just been killed 15 seconds earlier while defending an anti-Titan missile launch silo with my squad, and control of the silo had slipped into enemy hands. Unable to respond at the silo site and rejoin the fight directly, I quickly formulated an alternative strategy. I would instead respawn on my Titan warship, take a drop pod to launch Silo 1, which was still under our team control, and drive a fast attack vehicle back to my squad. As my pod hurtled towards the desert floor, the thought I had was this. Were this 3D game environment suddenly to become real, I would know what to do, when to do it, how to do it, and with whom. In other words, the activity systems of the game had become so familiar to me, I felt as if I could transfer what I learned in the game into the real world. It was an idea that changed how I thought about teaching and the role that technology could play in supporting and augmenting it. More important, however, was the question I asked myself next. Isn't this what I want my students to be able to do when they go to Germany? Could I make a game that teaches students how to navigate a difficult space in Germany, a train station, for example, and to provide them with the appropriate linguistic skills to manage this space before they even set foot in the country? Many games employ a quest structure to guide players through a game world. The idea of making a game that would teach students how to navigate a train station in Germany became my personal quest in the coming years. Working together with Brett Shelton and Brian McInnes, I developed an interactive fiction game in the tradition of the Zork text adventure. Purpose of the game was to teach students the German they would need to navigate a train station, to situate this knowledge in a descriptive space, to measure their knowledge retention and transfer, and to evaluate their attitudes towards the game. Creating the interactive fiction game was relatively straightforward and required few software resources. The spaces in the game corresponded with an idealized German train station, although these game spaces were textual and descriptive in nature. As is typical in Germany, in the game you can also park your bicycle in front of the train station and purchase Turkish food at a diner out in front or around the corner. Players can ask about connection information and purchase train tickets in the travel center located inside of the train station and can also purchase food and reading materials for the trip in the entrance hall. The player interrogates these textual game spaces by entering simple written commands at the command line. For example, betrachte person, observe the person, or nimm flasche, take the bottle. The compiler outputs text on the screen based on player input, which the player then has to read and make sense of. This iterative cycle of inputting and reading text moves the player forward through the game, which can unfold in unique ways based on player activity. So what did we learn from the design and development process? The bit.ly link at the bottom of the screen will lead you to an essay of our findings if you are interested. To summarize, a good understanding of programming is necessary, at least for Inform 6, and thankfully there is a wealth of resources available online to assist in this area. Inform 7 is a natural language-based programming language, which is meant to make the creation of interactive fiction games easier for non-programmers. You can also use Twine, which is an open source tool that publishes straight to HTML for creating interactive fiction stories. It is, however, difficult to anticipate every action that the player will take in the game and write code covering these eventualities. This makes for long code, 5,424 lines for this game to be exact, and a long time writing it. 
Since the game spaces describe real-world spaces, the language used in the game is also more complex and therefore difficult to scaffold. Students were also unfamiliar with playing a book, so to speak, and needed to be trained on the interface. This need was fortunately caught in the beta test of the game. That being said, all of this is manageable for one person and was a good test bed for later 3D versions of the game. And students did seem to benefit from the instructional approach, such as writing longer essays and using more vocabulary from the game in these essays. But I still did not have my 3D action-adventure game that I had set out to make. The next step I took, therefore, was a more ambitious project that I hoped would recreate the interactive fiction game in a 3D format. This, however, proved to be too much, and eventually I settled on a 3D game to teach German two-way prepositions in the context of German recycling and waste management systems. Did you throw the bottle into the trash can? You would need to use the accusative case to express this concept. Is the bottle in the can? You need to use the dative case. To get this project off the ground, I had to use a wider range of software resources. Hoping to build a game world as complete as the one in the interactive fiction game, I started off with a map that would help guide and focus my efforts. Here you see images for the underpass from the pedestrian zone to the train station, lots of fountains and trees, the bus depot in front of the station, and the pedestrian zone itself surrounded by the Turkish restaurant, bakery, clothing store, and cafe. What I actually ended up making, however, was quite a bit smaller and much more modest. A tower, a museum, some benches, a fountain, and some tree planters, and a few signs that one would normally find in a German pedestrian zone. Since this was my first attempt at 3D modeling and game programming, what you see here represents roughly one year of development work. Unlike the interactive fiction interface, the 3D interface focused primarily on the visual representation of the space with written text limited to a small window at the bottom of the screen. Text in this window displayed scaffolded grammar and vocabulary. Windows to manage money, health, and points added a thin element of play to the game. Students would navigate the 3D space, locate bottles and trash lying on the ground, and then dispose of them in the proper containers based on their understanding of the German recycling and waste management systems. Students received positive points for doing it correctly and had points subtracted for doing it incorrectly. So, what did I learn from this project? If you are interested, the bit.ly link at the bottom of the screen will take you to another essay describing my findings. My presentation tomorrow will also describe these findings in more detail. Again, a solid background in programming is essential, and although I ended up writing less code, the 3D interface was much more challenging than interactive fiction and presented a fairly substantial learning curve. Since the written language was confined to a small window at the bottom of the screen, and no textual description of the visual space was required, it was easier to scaffold language and align grammar and vocabulary with learning objectives. That being said, I was surprised to find that the game really did not help students learn German grammar. Students, however, expressed more realism in their written narratives, a sense of having had a lived experience. Their narratives were grammatically unpolished, but manifest a more thorough understanding of the activity systems that made up the simulated space. My current project uses elevations and floor plans from a 1940 historic American building survey to recreate a 19th century Louisiana sugar plantation, known as the Uncle Sam Plantation. Based on my experience with the 3D German game, I have become more interested in how mental narratives generated by immersion and 3D and VR environments can be utilized in the learning process. Of particular interest to me is how quest structures can be used to guide student activity in the game world and to align gameplay with instructional objectives. As you see here, quest structures in a 3D VR environment require an even more complicated coding approach. Objects interact with each other, pass information back and forth between each other, and pull information from flat database files. I will talk a bit more on activity systems and quest structures in my presentation tomorrow. With this iteration, as you can see, I'm experimenting with a more stripped-down interface that maximizes screen real estate and minimizes text output at the center of the screen. 
the effect I hope to achieve is one that capitalizes on a sense of presence and unmediated immersion in the digital environment. By placing brief text excerpts at the center of the screen, I hope to lessen the split attention effect that occurs when text is displayed at the bottom of the screen, but the player is still required to monitor the 3D VR environment. So, in conclusion, what have I learned from this quest and how could it be useful for this colloquium? I have found that game development is an iterative process moving from simple to complex and rough to polished. New ideas emerge from the flow of this process. I've also found it useful to prototype a game in two different platforms, although these platforms will align with different learning objectives. Text-based is good for reading, 3D and VR are good for activity systems, mental narratives, and emotional experience. The challenge, I think, will be to align the ability of 3D and VR to generate mental narratives with specific learning objectives. Viewing gameplay as existing within a framework of activity systems can be potentially helpful in this process. I will speak more on this tomorrow. Finally, I have found it exciting, but also necessary for my career, to continually level up with new hardware and software. My quest, therefore, has been one of constant challenge and growth. Not only has this openness to new technologies helped me to adapt to changes in higher education, but I think it will also help our fields move forward and retain their relevance in the 21st century.